Hello and welcome to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. We are heading toward another interesting weekend in the college football season, loaded with consequential games. We're also off to another rough start to the week with seven games having already been postponed as of this recording on Tuesday afternoon. Let's hope we get them all in because college football is starting to run out of real estate to have a complete or close to a complete season. Though there has been lingering speculation about delaying the playoff as a way to lengthen the regular season, so far it's been driven more by talk radio and social media than the people who actually make those decisions. We also have the first head coaching vacancy in the Power Five after South Carolina fired Will Muschamp. We'll discuss all of that and more with my guest and friend, Dennis Dodd from CBS Sports. Thanks for listening to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. You can find us on Westwood One Podcast, Apple Podcast, just about anywhere you like to get your podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a good review, give us a good rating. It helps college football fans find us, and it helps us find more college football fans. And away we go. My guest this week on the podcast is Dennis Dodd, the great Dennis Dodd, my friend from CBS Sports. Dennis, man, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. There's a lot going on, as always. Um, We are going to start in a place that um, a topic that's gotten a lot of chatter lately, and I'm not really sure if it's just chatter between you and I. Uh, and pe- po- folks who do what we do, or if it's legitimately something that the people who make the decision are planning on doing, and that's extending the regular season via pushing back the playoff. D- do you do you get any sense that there's a great desire among the people who count to do that? No, I don't think there's a desire at all to do that. I, I think... By doing due diligence, though, they have to think about it and they have to prepare for it because it's one thing like doing it now. We're going to push it back and, you know, just give the time for these teams to prepare. It's another not being prepared. And three days before the game, a position group goes out and you can't have the game. Um, You know, you've got to have this in your hip pocket where you can pivot even within a week, I think, of of the semifinals or the championship game. Uh, And there was a report this week that, in fact, Larry Scott, the Pac-12 commissioner, had brought that up, that we need to start thinking about this. And it it was going to be on um, the commissioner's agenda when they met, I think, on Wednesday of this week to speak over the phone or Zoom or whatever. So I think it's something they have to prepare for. If they don't, they're not doing their jobs. So so let's let's make this this, this, distinct. Yeah, be distinct here, because I think that's the thing that even I think fans sort of hear and maybe don't uh, pull the two pieces apart and, and look at them separately. I think there's a lot of talk about, hey, if you extend the regular, if you push back the playoff, mm-hmm. you extend the regular season, you could use December 26th as a weekend to play championship games. And that helps you make up all these games that are getting postponed. We're already up to seven this week. There were 15 last week. Uh, when I say there's no desire to push back the playoff, I think that's sort of what I mean. And, and I think that, again, there's a lot of folks who are looking at it who don't necessarily want the season extended. When you talk to people about oh, the right. idea of yeah. extending the regular season, what are you hearing? Yeah, uh, I have not heard any of that. And But that doesn't mean it's not a viable discussion point because, again, I think that has to be something that they have to be able to pivot to if you're going to decide a champion. Um, the problem is, as we've already seen with some of these postponed games, not everybody's going to do it at once. Does that make sense? I mean, I think you've got to have that in your hip pocket where if we need to, then we're going to go to the 26th. Not not ideal. Um, in fact, whatever it is, five days before the semifinals, and, and it would impact bowls uh, possibly because there's already some bowls scheduled to be played on the 19th. 
but I, I have not, and maybe that's my fault for not looking at it, you know, uh, reverse engineering it instead of looking all the way to the playoff. But I think that's something they have to look at. Well, okay, let, let's just you and I talk about this as opposed to me like grilling you. Because I look <laughs> at it, because I'm sure you've heard some of the same things. It's the idea of, you know, Greg Sankey called it the finish line. Like we got to have a yeah. finish line. And, and what, you know, what you end up hearing from folks is, I mean, I talked to one administrator who was just like, push it back, like push it up. Like let's, let's just get yeah. this thing done next week. Like, like it's not like things aren't getting better at a certain point. We just sort of have to draw a line and say, we're going to do as best as we can by this point. And, you know, we're never going to be able to satisfy everything. We're never going to be able to get all these games. Well, you maybe, maybe you can, maybe in the SEC, maybe in the ACC, maybe yeah. in the big 12, yeah. they can get all their games in. But I, I think that there is an exhaustion level going on throughout a lot of college football where for a lot of folks it's just like we just got to get this season in let's just get it in and and i'm wondering like if you're hearing some of the same things and and what you just think of that like it just it used to me i I just feel like there's a lot of like fatigue in throughout a lot of college football and the idea of extending it is almost like sort of extending the torture (laughs) You know? Right, right. Yeah, at that point, just pick the highest ranked team and move on or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it goes, it's not an exact parallel, but it's the parallel with people. Oh, but what a perfect year to expand the playoff, go from four to eight and let all these teams in. Well, no, it, we're playing, you know, we're playing between raindrops. I think we all agree with that, with COVID. To, to create more games which would be more opportunities for them to be impacted or canceled and more people maybe to get sick, I don't think is, is the best idea. So yeah, if that's the conversation and I'll, I'll say it again, I have not, I have not looked at it that way. Mm-hmm. I have not looked at it from the regular season standpoint. I just, my mind just went right to the playoff. Um, yeah, I could see that. It's like, at some point we just have to call a stop to this. And if we can't play, we can't play. And, you know, you move on. You know, all of this is not about it started out to be about um, inventory for the networks. But at the end of the day, may, maybe it's not because we just have to put a stop to this and, and move on to the next level. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I found myself thinking a lot and I've had I had a conversation and we'll get into a, another topic here through this little segue. So I had a conversation with an agent who represents a lot of mm-hmm. coaches and, you know, he had said, listen, you know, Monday through Friday, we're looking at this season and seeing all the canceled and, and postponed games. And, and we talk about, you know, how hard it is just to get these players onto the field and all the struggles of what goes into this season. But on Saturday, they play games and then we all sort of make it feel normal. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why guys like Bill Muschamp get fired. And that's why coaches get fired because, yeah. well, intuitively, Monday through Friday, we know this season is nuts, right? This is just right. not normal. But for right. some, when the results are played out, fans are still looking at it going, no, 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 I want my team to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When we get that, that's exactly right. When we get to Saturday, it, it, it's exactly like that. And when, during the week, it's like there's this, this underground current, what are they doing? What do they think they're doing? Are they putting these players in danger? And then we all want to see the games, but you know, how they get there. And now we're at the point I saw that, I saw that Dave Gavitt was talking on uh, a conference, the conference call yesterday to announce the Indianapolis thing. And, mm-hmm. and Dave Gavitt's the guy who runs the, the tournament for the NCAA. And he, he made the point that only 15% of college football games have been canceled. You know, if you if you if you had told somebody on March first that that was going to happen, they they you know, how how can the sport go on? And mm-hmm. even though it is fifteen percent, you you would know better than anybody, Ralph, because you're the go to <laughs> guy for the Trying number of games right. canceled. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that yeah, there's fifteen percent, and then there's the actual raw number. Which is now what you tell me over 60, 58 or 60? Yeah, I think it's 70, yeah, yeah. depending on how you count them. Right. So that's a hell of a lot of football games that that have to be accounted for or not. You know, a lot of them are canceled. So yeah, I, I think that that is the mindset from week to week. 
Well, and one of the things that's happened with all those canceled games, too, is, and this is going to sound awful, but it's just the way we consume football, and it's the way I think the general population, the fan base consumes college football, is that, yeah, there has been 15% of the games, but how many of them really, those games are the games that really matter? Yeah. Right? Because at a certain, yeah. and this goes back to my comment from the, the administrator who would like play the playoff next week. You know, how many games need to be played to determine Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, and another team? Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, right, right, right. And reality yeah. is not that many. Yeah, so we, think, we know, we know, we have a good idea of three of the four right now. Yeah, I think, right. And Notre Dame obviously should be in there. And, and we'll see. But, but, but even if you expand it out to like a, a, a playoff race with some, some kind of integrity, you know, if Texas A&M gets its games in and Florida gets its games in, and if you want to say Cincinnati, like, like the, the pool of teams that really affect championships, and you can even bring it down another level to co- conference championships. We're already at the point where most of the conference is, is, you know, championships are kind of been whittled down to only a few teams. I know that's not really the case in the Pac-12 and the, and the Big Ten because they've played so few games, especially in the Pac-12, where you don't really have a dominant team. But man, if you can just get like Wisconsin and Ohio State to play all their games, and I know that like fans of other teams will be like, wow, what are you talking about? We have as much of a chance and don't we get a chance? But it's just in this particular season, it's hard to really, it's almost hard to, to sort of worry about that. I just think that we're playing a lot of games to present the illusion that a lot of teams have chances that they yeah, really don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which is which is college football today anyway. You know, it's, uh, as I you know, before this season, twelve teams had played for, been in the playoff in six years. Twelve, uh, and it, it, you know the LSU last year was the outlier. They were the newbie mm-hmm. the team that went fifteen and zero. So only then twelve teams play for it. So if you want to talk about parity, I got your parity right here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that that being said, yeah. Um, that that is the case. The the whole idea of the Big Ten starting start was to get Ohio State to the playoff. Starting with Ohio State, you know, yeah. we, we saw the lengths they were going to go to, to go there. Um, what concerns me, and the the CFP folks won't answer this, is that they they are not in the business of setting uh, minimums for qualification for the playoff. Mm-hmm. They they want that you know the committee and eye tests and everything. Which leads to, and I just picked this one off the top of my head this week, a seven and zero Wisconsin that somehow beats um, Ohio State is in competition for a playoff spot with an eleven and zero Cincinnati that won their conference, um, a nine and one Texas A and M, which would be the second team from the SEC. Assuming those guys get all their games in, because they have- assuming they get all their games in, <laughs> I, I, I popped right. I, I think I think I, I think Wisconsin would be in, but there'd be a heck of a shouting match between Mike Oresco and some people, just by the mere fact that they got all their games in, and and won them. And you know, the Big Ten had to reschedule to get theirs in. Um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm thinking too much. Well, no, but Brian Kelly said it this week too, right? Didn't, didn't Kelly say we've already played a Big Ten schedule? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's. I don't want to say much tougher, but tougher than what they had scheduled. Well, I think. Yeah, if just yeah. Like, just on number of games, right? They've already played a Big Ten schedule, and quite frankly, like Ohio State's not going to play a team better than Clemson. So you can you can parse who's better between, you know, Michigan State and Penn State and Georgia Tech and uh, and Louisville. But that but you know ultimately the his point was right. We've played as many games. And we played one of the best teams in the country. So why are we comparing ourselves? But again, it goes back to sort of like we're having those type of conversations with the backdrop of this sort of bastardized season. And I, and, and Monday through Friday, I find myself stepping back and going, what, like, why are we even having these conversations? Like, I know. <laughs> who even knows what the what the reality is of these teams trying yeah. to get on the field from week to week? And 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 who and how we are yeah. judging any of this seems to be completely cluttered. But uh, but again, we get to Saturday and then we have to write about, you know, the playoff race. And 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 again, I'm not this is not me like 
hammering fans or hammering coaches. Like I think no. as a, as a writer who covers this, I'm going through the same sort of you know dual personality of like what are we even trying to accomplish here does any of this really count and then also flipping back to okay let's let's talk playoff <laughs> you know you know you can call me a debbie downer all you want but we all now have a working knowledge of epidemiology <laughs> and contact tracing and positive rates and sensitivity because you have to because because if 3 days before the the Big Ten championship game, uh, Justin Fields it tests positive and has to sit out three weeks. You tell me what happens, fan, <laughs> college football. You tell me what happens. So you have to have an idea of what's going on here. Um, and, I, and I say that loosely, an idea. <laughs> well, and I... And I and I opened yes exactly. Um, so I opened the door to the to the coaching search situation, and Will Muschamp became the first Power Five coach to get mm -hmm. fired, um, even in a pandemic, even with its school bleeding money because of you know revenue that lost because of ticket sales and games not played and things along those lines. Um, they are still going to find 13 and change million uh, in the seat cushions at, <laughs> in Columbia yeah. to pay Will Muschamp not to coach. Um, do you think this provide like, in other words, is it a situation where, OK, once we've seen one school do it now, others will get sort of more confident to do it? Did, did it matter? Are we going to get more anyway? I'm wondering what your assessment of you know, having sort of South Carolina break the seal on this. Yeah, that, I was just going to use that term, break the seal. I I think it does. I, You know, it may have been someone else who was going to do it, but, you know, yes, it's the SEC, and, and yes, it's a big buyout, but it, it is symbolically, yeah, that this is going to be a wacky, um, silly season. Once again, where – you know, a middling team from the SEC is is firing a coach because guess what is a month from now? The early signing day. And we, even in the middle of a pandemic, we have to have a co coach in place where we can get kids. And there was no buzz about that program. I don't have to go in about how mediocre they were defensively for a defensive coach. And they're willing to spend, I ca calculated it in my head, Ralph, it's going to be a $30 million investment to, to make that move. You know, whatever it is, 13 to 15 uh, buyout, paying off the assistants with multi-year contracts because that's what they have, at least the coordinators in the SEC, and then doing the same to hire a staff uh, with a multi-year deal for the next coach. You're talking about you're talking about 30 million dollars. And, and so they're willing to do that while I don't know what South Carolina's number is, but it's going to be a negative um, in revenue this year. While enduring that and taking out a loan to make ends meet, they think that investment is worth it. And it's not just, my point is, it's not going to be just a South Carolina thing. You know, you're going to see, you know, possibly UCLA make that decision with, with Chip Kelly. And I'm not, I'm just grabbing him out of midair. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Harbaugh is a separate talking point because that's got about 13 different tentacles, but they would make that decision. So I, I think it's it's on like Donkey Kong now. I think it's back it's back to where it was uh, before the pandemic in, in the silly season. So I, I still think it will be a little slower than normal. I, I think that there are. I think we we'll see. I think we'll, we'll see some slowdown is within the group of five. I, I do think there's a whole bunch of you know smaller revenue schools sure. that normally might have said, "Yeah, I'll pull the plug." That will just you know punt it. Um, I, I, listen, every every college football podcast, and I listen to a lot of them that our friends do and that we do, and th you know, things along the has become like thirty minutes of Harbaugh talk over the last. Few years. <laughs> so I try. So I'm trying not to get too deep into that. But you, you like a lot of us, has written about Harbaugh. Can you, let, let's just try to compact this into about a five minute deal. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it's over too. I, I think it feels like for the first time, the trajectory, it, it, in other words, it's no longer just an Ohio State problem. I, used, I was a big Harbaugh defender and, say, and I used to say, listen, he, he, it's not necessarily a, a Harbaugh problem. It's an Ohio State problem. They're a rocket ship. And when your main competition is a rocket ship, it's just going to be hard yeah. to keep up. But that's not really the case anymore. 
what do you see as a as a realistic scenario for Harbaugh leaving? Because again, this is not your average. This is not going to play out like South Carolina. This is not just going to be, hey, hey, Jim, you're done. Yeah. It before I answer that, you know, it looks like it's over because, and I raised it in my piece this week. To the naked eye, it looks like there's a compete level problem. I'm not going to say the word quit Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say Michigan's the only one because in the middle of COVID, who knows, Mm -hmm. you know, it's hard enough for the teams that are winning to hold it together. You know, what about teams that see no future in a truncated season? So there's that. Um, And I I asked Jim Harbaugh that on zoom directly on, on, uh, on Monday. You know, I, I, I said, is the, is the buy-in still there? And he said, he said something that didn't exactly answer the question, but I did ask the question, how it happens, I've said this for months, he won't be fired because he won't allow himself to be fired. You know, the ultimate Michigan man, he will walk away in some fashion where it's a mutual agreement, he goes to the NFL, uh, he is, you know, he, it's just not gonna be a firing where he wakes up one day and goes, what the heck, I thought I was the coach of Michigan. (laughs) And there's this big drawn out thing. They're not going to do that. you know, he, uh, he's, a, he's a very good coach. He'll end up on his feet, possibly in college, possibly in the NFL. But it's just, you know, when, he, when you say it hasn't worked, it's just so complicated. Before the season, Ralph, his winning percentage, only 10 coaches at their current school had a better winning percentage of, than 723. And you can name him probably off the top of your head, the best of the best. But he hadn't beaten Ohio State. He hadn't won a division championship. In his 13 years as a head coach, he hadn't done so much as that. And the bluster didn't mat- match the results ultimately after six years. So that that's what's going on. Um, it's just and, – and you start getting into the fact that he, he hasn't developed a quarterback, which is still stunning to me in this day and age, you know, uh, where if you have a quarterback, you have a chance. The Jim Harbaugh, captain comeback, a quarterback in his career, hasn't been able to develop one. So the only other question I'd ask you is give me your, if Harbaugh is no longer the coach, who is the next, give me, and listen, we're all speculating here. It's all fun. It's all fun and games guessing, but who would you think would be the next coach of Michigan if Harbaugh is no longer the coach? You hear, and I already put it out there. I wrote it. Um, You know, there's, first of all, the, I, I don't know if the word is the irony Maybe the two best candidates they will never get. They will never get Urban Meyer and they will never get Luke Fickle. Yeah. And we know why. Yeah. I don't have to tell you why. So they won't get those. Too much. So who do they get? Yeah. 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 And that and that's sad, really. You know, it's like it's like when uh, in the middle of everything in Texas that our Bryles name came up. And that was immediately poo-pooed. And now this is I, I believe this was before the yeah. the scandal. Right, exactly. And and it was immediately poo-pooed by by the higher ups at Texas. Well, he's from Baylor. He's this scruffy looking 60, 62 year old from Baylor. We're not hiring a Baylor coach. Well, how does that look now? I mean, and, and until Tom Herman plays out or not, mm-hmm. um, I just think schools do themselves a disservice on that type of thing. But uh, in, in the names, I think you got to look at a Matt Campbell at Iowa State. There'd be some stability. Um, uh, a Bill O'Brien, I don't know how that would be met at Michigan who I'm hearing once back into college. Now, is that, uh, is Michigan the job for him? I don't know. He, re- not resurrected, but kept Penn State from cratering um, after the uh, sexual abuse scandal. Uh, a, uh, if if there's one place that Brian Kelly, you know, there are, two, there are about two tracks for Brian Kelly, retirement at Notre Dame, the NFL, or, you know, does he take a shot at Michigan with, with the advantage of a, of a public school without the academic strictures of, of Notre Dame. Um, that might be a long shot, but that's the question. If, if, if you haven't, if the ultimate Michigan man hasn't worked out, who are you going to get? Yeah. I, I think Matt Campbell would be perfect. I, I've always been a big, a kind of a, a honk for him. I, I thought, just he's an impressive guy. I think he's got the right temperament and sort of the right where he wants his culture to be is sort of in the in the 
pocket of where Michigan is. He certainly is from that area, right? He's a Mount Union guy. He's an Ohio guy. Michigan needs to recruit Ohio better. And, you know, you talk, this is the last thing I'll say on this, on this topic. So you talk about effort, right? Um, remember when Harbaugh first got his first year there, first year or two there, one of the pe- people who does like, I can't remember who it was, but somebody who does like good X's and O stuff on Twitter, one of the many follows that I do that d- does X and O stuff, did a good breakdown of like, hey, like coaching, sometimes we get a little too wrapped up on scheme. A lot of coaching is you coach effort and you coach technique. And when you play with strong effort and good technique, um, like players play better. And it was a good film breakdown of like, the first couple of years of Michigan when they were playing really high level defense, especially of like, this is a, this, this is a sign up effort and technique effort. The effort piece seems to have gone away from where Michigan is now. Just like you said, the buy-in part, I think with Matt Campbell, you like, he is a coach that you see the effort and technique part because he is not, getting the best players. Iowa State should never be and never has and never before has been a team that beats Oklahoma and beats all these other teams in the Big 12. So I think what you would be getting with Matt Campbell, the thing that I know like you would get with Matt Campbell is someone who understands how to coach effort and whose teams play hard. And from there, we'll see what happens with scheme and how you develop a quarterback and things along those lines. But I think everything about Campbell seems to me to be the thing that Michigan sort of has a lot of the things that Michigan, I think, needs right now. Yeah, no, I, I, and, I and I think we've seen his ceiling at Iowa State. If he can get uh, in consecutive years, Iowa State was in the playoff race in mid-November last year. The playoff race, yeah, not just, just in the, not it, the big, right? Just in the, the big twelve of it, even yeah. just being on the peripheral of it, is exactly the, right. And and they and they currently stand five and one in a conference for the first time ever. He's done that. Um, they haven't won a conference championship, by the way, since the Missouri Valley in nineteen twelve. So, and, and they're right there. And we all know they're right there for the Big 12 this year. So he, he's maxed out what Iowa State could be. So then the next sentence is, imagine what he could do at a Michigan where you have um, access to that kind of talent. And to be fair, you know, again, Jim Harbaugh's recruited pretty good. But part of, part of this whole discussion is Ohio State's head and shoulders above not only everyone in the Big 10, but pretty much everyone in the country you know, except for a couple of teams. So that that's the roadblock. I, I remember early on, before it was like this, it, they were winning 10 games and they were good and they were top 10. And then they hit that Michigan, that Ohio State game, and it was like er, hitting a brick wall. Um, except, except for the fourth down game, which if that's measured a different way, maybe we're having a different discussion right now. Maybe everything goes different. I don't know. All right, so I want to take a very quick break here, and then I'm going to spin it forward, and we're going to talk about Saturdays. We're going to we're going to remove all all the all the dark clouds that are hanging over, and we're just going to try to preview Saturday. I'm talking with Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports, my friend, and uh, the great Dennis Dodd, uh, and we will be back on the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast right after this. Hey, it's Michael Rosenbaum. You may remember me as Lex Luthor from the hit TV show Smallville. Regardless, I have this really cool podcast called Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum, where I get celebrities who are a lot more famous than me to really open up. Let's get inside of Jim Jeffries. Oh, I never did anything with my life. I could have been a better son. Oh, God. I should apologize to this person. So join me on Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. New episodes drop every Tuesday. Listen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. And we're back on the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. I'm talking with Dennis Dodd, the great Dennis Dodd from CBS Sports, my friend. Uh, so it is an interesting weekend. I mean, if we can get it, it's Tuesday. We've already had seven games uh, postponed or, or canceled. Um, Texas A&M is the most high profile of teams that has that has that that will not be playing. But otherwise, the slate looks really, really good. So if we can get to this weekend relatively unscathed, it looks like one of those Saturdays where we, we will be able to suspend disbelief and uh, and let our minds um, just wander into what how cool college football is. And I think it starts in the Big Ten where you have this upside down Big Ten. 
um, where Michigan and Penn State stink. And we're, we're already written off Nebraska again, but Indiana is really good and Northwestern is really good. And those two teams each play big games, not against each other, but against their division rivals. Um, how seriously do you think we should be taking Indiana? I, I think they're a nice story. I think they're a well-coached team that we knew was on an upturn and, um, you know, best one eight last year year for the first time in 27 years and uh you know beat what we now know is a not very good penn state team but that shouldn't be diminished uh to the point that i i ask uh, michael Penix jr this week i said you know if if you're right-handed are we having this discussion right now because <laughs> because he's first of all he's a rarity as a left-handed quarterback and then he may or may not have gotten in against Penn State, but the only reason we're having the conversation is because he was able to stretch out as a lefty. Now you can say he would have run the other way as a righty and done the same thing, but um, you know, uh, but so he, just that small margin makes them what they are now. And you have Tom Allen crying about his son getting hurt, um, and a, a bunch of these try-hard guys. Uh, I, I'd like to. I'd like to think that that's going to be, you know, a competitive game. But but Ohio State's three touchdown favorites. They haven't played for a week, two weeks. Um, I think they'll be ready to get out of the gate and, and do their business. I, I'd like to see it close. I mean, I think the Indiana Hoosiers playing like the movie Hoosiers is great theater. But – uh, I, I think Ohio State's really, really good. Yeah, I, I think that there's a there's a roadmap there where uh, you know between Penix being, I, I don't know if he's a great quarterback. He's a very, very good quarterback. He's a very talented kid. He is tough as nails. He never gets sacked, and he will. He stands in there, man. Like I, the, like the most impressive thing to me. I remember watching the end of that. Penn State game when they were making that march and how many times he delivered passes at points when forget like the pressure was on him like I actually thought he was sacked and the ball came out <laughs> like so he's a tough kid he stands in there I think that will work against the you know an Ohio State team that's probably not as good defensively as it was last year and I think I'd just be interested from like an X's and O's standpoint if between Penix and those good receivers they can exploit some things that might not be as good on Ohio State this year in their secondary as it was last year. When they have Chase Young and Okuda and all those guys, I just this Ohio State defense is not quite that level, and I wonder if, if Indiana can exploit some of those things. Yeah, not not quite. They still have Sean, da Sean Davis in the secondary. who's an All-American. Sean Wade. Sean Wade. Sean Wade. Yeah. Just, you know, I confuse him with Wyatt Davis. Um and look, I yeah, he'll line up on whoever's hot that day, Wap Fillior or Ty Fry Fogel. Mm -hmm. um, be best combination of receivers' names, by the way, in the yeah. country. And and I and I think take their chances. But um, yeah, you're you're right about everything you said. Ohio State's not as good as they were defensively, but uh, Indiana, I think, is going to have to have a running game on the road, uh, even though no fans in in some in a setting like this. It, and not talked about much is. Um, Scotty Stevens, their best running back, hasn't had as good a year as he did last year. Not as explosive or maybe not running as much. So, um, you know, we'll see. Yeah, they've relied a lot on turnovers and things along those lines. Again, I hate to be the guy who, like, sort of, you know, pees on the Indiana parade. But I, I, I right, I, right. I, that, was, little, that was the question. <laughs> yeah, but I've also been the, the sort of – I have been sort of the voice of, like, is this team really the number nine team in the country throughout this whole yeah, thing? Yeah. And, I, and I'll spin that to this. Like, I think Northwestern – might be better than Indiana, but they haven't be beaten as many famous teams. Like Indiana beat the famous teams. They beat right. Penn State and they beat Michigan and Michigan State. When Northwestern has kind of ground through the Purdue's and the Iowa's, not quite as famous, but that Northwestern team, and now listen, I don't think they're as good as Ohio State either, but that Northwestern team has got a really good defense with some guys who will be drafted on it. And they tend to give Wisconsin some fits, and you can and you can write that F-I-T-S or F-I-T-Z. Um, what, what are you thinking about this, uh, this matchup over in the Big Ten West? And I meant Stevie Scott, not Scotty Stevens. I'm, I'm That's okay. I'm it. dyslexic. It's, um, it's all code. <laughs> yeah. No, they just – they haven't gotten the attention of Indiana because Indiana's had more high-profile high wins 
and they're a better story, even though you have the ultimate, you know, um, alma mater guy in Pat Fitzgerald who does a great job almost year after year, but the defense is good, and that's what's carried them. And you've got these two uh, games between a pair of undefeateds, upside down games in the Big Ten. And I frankly have to dig down and see what they're doing right. I have to look at some Northwestern film, as they say in the post game, um, <laughs> to see what they're doing right. The, the Wisconsin thing uh, fascinates me just because they had, what, three weeks off. They've only played two games. And I can look out my office window and see Graham Mertz's home. His, his family lives in the next subdivision. He's here from. Uh, Lives here in Kansas. Oh wow! I know, yeah, and I know his dad. So, kind of a, not not a rooting interest. But he's a good kid, uh, you know. And they've done it a different way. They just, you know, lambasted Michigan, but don't have a go-to running back. They're not going to have that um, John Taylor type this year. It doesn't feel like it. Uh, so I, you know, Northwestern's got a heck of a chance at home. I think against the Wisconsin team that. You know, frankly, I, offensively doesn't have an identity yet. Does that does that make sense? No, it, I, right. I mean, I think Wisconsin always knows what it wants to be. Sure, but sure. It's, but it's figuring out. I think it's still figuring out what its best self is this year. Uh, and we'll see how that plays out against again again a Wisconsin team that even in its in its in its down years, you know, just sort of matches up well against Wisconsin. It always seems to give Wisconsin a hard time. I want to switch over to Bedlam. And do you see? I still think you know if, if Oklahoma State can win out, they're they're a viable playoff team. Uh, first of all, do you think that can happen? I I, I kind of wonder if Oklahoma right now is the best team in the Big Twelve, but will have a hard time getting to the Big Twelve championship game. Yeah, um, the two best, you know, the two franchise programs both have two losses: Oklahoma and Texas. But you're right about Oklahoma State. If they went out, they would have the tiebreaker over Iowa State. They've beaten them, who leads the league. The question is, will they? Because hmm. Mike Gundy's 2-13 and 13 against Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, I think the, the one and only time they won the conference when he, he's, since he's been there is 2011 uh, when they won the league and went to the Fiesta Bowl, I want to say, but had that horrible loss – on a Friday night, I think, at Iowa State that kept them out of the playoff by point, you know, point zero three six. I think that's actually the number. Yeah, point the, zero the three six days points. when they were when they, and they yeah. got, they got, they got kind of I thought they got screwed. I, I would have liked to have, you know, yeah. like to have seen a different uh, instead of a rematch. But that's that's what are Yeah. Up. That being said, the only loss is, is to Texas when I think they turned it over four times and still almost won in overtime. Mm -hmm. So I, I think they've I think they've got a shot. The problem is that's got to be in their heads that Oklahoma, you know, is this going to be the same as it's always been? It's at Norman. Oklahoma's playing well. They've rebounded since the early losses. Spencer Rattler seemed to, to have calmed down. And the biggest thing is they got Ramondre Stevenson and Ronnie Perkins back from those drug suspensions. That, I keep reading the papers down there, that's been a huge addition. Um, you know, now they have some options running the ball. They're, they're not going to have huge numbers. But after losing Trey Sermon to Oklahoma, um, you know, they didn't have much. And, you know, with, with Ramondre, Ramondre Stevenson coming back, they do have some depth. So I, I, I like Oklahoma, but this might be the best, one of the best teams that Mike Gundy's had because they're very good defensively. Uh, you know about the weapons on offense. Chuba Hubbard is a shadow of what he was last year. Uh, when he rushed for 2,000 yards, they're still putting up points. Yeah. You know, they, they still they, have they've, a, had, they've had a lot of offensive yeah. line issues, right? I mean, they've had they have they get hurt, and I, I don't even like I, I would have to go, you know, do a, qu a little quick research. I don't know where they stand now, but I know that they've had guys in and out of that offensive line um, a, a lot of this season. And, and Spencer Sanders is like, you know, it's funny you talk about Spencer Rattler calming down. Uh, the other Spencer on the other side needs to calm down. Like he just, like it, you find uh, he is still a guy who. Um, and provide some thrills for both teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, he and he had a bad day against Texas, and that's what's kept them out of the playoff discussion. And then, you know, if, if they went out, are they part of that discussion? I, I imagine they are. But again, they're competent. They're going to most likely be in competition for a fourth spot. 
And that, right now, as it stands, would be a second team from the SEC, um, a Cincinnati, right. and I'm trying to think who else, uh, a second team from the ACC. So that that roster does not bode well for Oklahoma State getting in a playoff. Um, you know, their best win would be over um, – over Oklahoma, at number eighteen at the time, I believe. Yeah, yeah, and which would end up having a three three losses, you know. And again, they, uh, it, you know, Bedlam. It, it, it's got a great nickname. It, it 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 often provides some interesting thrills, especially in recent years, because the nature of that conference is is so up and down. So we get some wild games, but as you stated, the record is Oklahoma always wins. <laughs> Oklahoma yeah, right. always wins. We get it. We can break this down, but yeah, Oklahoma's going to win. Yeah, yeah. So, so you mentioned Cincinnati. They have probably what I think, and, and this is no disrespect to Tulsa, but I, I, because I, Tulsa beat UCF, so of course Tulsa fans feel free to get upset with me. Um, but I still think UCF is probably the toughest team left on on Cincinnati's schedule, especially because it's down there in Orlando. Though again, Tulsa won down there. Um, uh, I think it's a fascinating game because I do think. UCF, listen, they're not, you know, they, you know, some, it's just not going to always work out in your favor every year, right? You're not going to go undefeated every year, but they, with Dylan Gabriel and that offense, they are still capable of doing some really high level things on the offensive side. Cincinnati has been a, just a, just a, a machine. Uh, I, I've been so impressed with them becoming not just a grinded out team like they have the last couple of years, but now Ritter's playing much better at quarterback. I mean, they're demolishing what is a pretty good conference. Um, does Cincinnati have what it takes to sort of stand up to them physically? Excuse yeah, me, I, UCF. Does UCF has what it, have what it takes to stand up to, U, to UC's physicality? No, I, I think Cincinnati's one of the most complete teams in the country. It was about three games ago, and I forget who the opponent was. Oh, it was SMU. It was SMU where they where they just um, they ended up boat racing. SMU um, uh, went in there, and Desmond Ritter was fantastic uh, that day. And SMU was playing from behind the entire game, and it was that point. Say, so, okay, they were. You know, it was Luke Fickle's defensive team to that point. Now they are a full, fully formed team. My uh, the offensive coordinator, by the way, is, is Mike Denbrock. Who was an assistant for at Kelly. no, yeah, for Kelly from yeah. 2010 to 16, and I don't, I haven't looked up how how he left. It may have been just a situation where Fickle got the job and brought him in, but he's done a fantastic job with Desmond Ritter as a thrower and a runner. This Jared Dokes, um, the receivers are really really good, so they they are. Well, I'm not going to say they are what UCF used to be because their defense is much better than UCF. But that being said, Dylan Gabriel, if he heats up, this could be over early. He's the leading. I think he has the most passing yards in the country. He's just fantastic. Uh, they've been great. Now, they lost, obviously, earlier in the year, as you mentioned. They've lost twice. But so there's no, there's nothing, you know, they can march down the middle of the street and claim national championships <laughs> and parade about. But I, I said this about Cincinnati. This is as close as any team from the group of five has come to even being in the discussion about a playoff spot because if they can finish the deal, because at the end of the day, they will have, you can't say scheduled because they will play five teams, including UCF, who were either ranked when they played them or were ranked at one, one point in this season. Now, if that's a reach for a group of five teams, so be it. But I think Cincinnati's legitimate. I think they played a tough schedule. And I think the Americans really deep this year and playing all those conference games, just like we were told the SEC, you know, all those conference games count for something, uh, is going to count for them. So, no, I, I, I like Cincinnati. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on this. Like, I, I understand, like, it's not a Auburn, LSU, Texas A&M kind of gauntlet or the type of situations where you could in in some of the Power Five conferences and especially the SEC, there are, there are times when you could have a lineup and a schedule that is really brutal. Right. Uh, it's not that level. But 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 to do what they did, Cincinnati did to Memphis, to SMU, to Houston, these teams that are our functional team with with legitimate talent and highly operating offenses and to just shut those offenses down. 
and and they're probably going to need some style points. Like, it, it, like I don't think just beating, getting by against UCF is probably not going to be a great look. And I don't think it's a great look for them, you know, if they just get by Tulsa. But if they go out there and really slam UCF, and then in, you know a few weeks from now, you know, play Tulsa in that makeup game. That- we're supposed to have played by now. And again, the margins of victories are high enough. I still think the chances that they get in are fairly slim, but I do think that they are, it, it gives them a legitimate opportunity to be the beneficiary of chaos, right? I think that's where Cincinnati wants to be. They want to be positioned in a, in a position where if things get weird in the other conferences, they can be the default option. Right, right. That yeah, in a in a strange year, and I think one of the biggest advantages they have, if it comes down to comparing against those teams we mentioned, they will have played eleven games. Mm-hmm. You know, eleven and zero is going to look pretty good uh, with a conference championship versus, you know, Texas A and M can't afford to lose another game or else they're out of it. Um, who else did we say was in there? Yeah, uh, exactly. Another, you know, a second Florida, team from the listen, Florida. ACC. Yeah, if Alabama, you know, gets you know, hands Florida another loss, then you sort of throw them to the side. Let's yeah. let, let's create a world where Notre Dame beats Clemson again, and you sort of toss them to the side again. You know, and 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 Oklahoma beats Oklahoma State this week, and all of a sudden, everybody in like it. The, the road, all the contenders have two losses. Yeah, basically, the, the yeah. road to getting a situation where you have to give ser- Cincinnati serious thought is not a convoluted path. No, not, I'm no. not asking you to come up with these like wild scenarios where, well, how could that possibly ever happen? All we're asking for is Alabama to take care of business, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, and you can see a path. It's not. It's. It, for the first time, it's a little bit legitimate uh, discussion to me in that if all the contenders that we just mentioned lose twice, who are you going to pick? You got to pick them, you know, and it's not it's not so outlandish that Notre Dame would sweep um, Clemson or that Texas A&M would lose another game or, um, you know, th- those would be the two main ones. But who else you got? And, and we'll find out next week, really, where they stand when the college football playoff rankings yeah. come out for the first time. You know, you, you look at the AP poll, but I always caution people, the AP poll, for all its, you know, for all of its limitations, generally will treat those teams. And when I say those teams, the group of five, non-power five teams, generally treat those teams a lot better than the playoff committee does. What, what was it a year ago or two years ago, Mississippi State had... Uh, had lost three times and was above one of these teams that we're talking about, yeah. the group of five teams that we're talking about. Yeah. Well, that's just outlandish. It's not, I mean, I know SEC fans think that way, that the, the version of football they play on the West Coast is foreign to this planet, but that's just ridiculous. And I, I've just got this feeling in my stomach or in my mind that Cincinnati's going to be 11th next week. <laughs> they're going to win by 20 and they're going to be 11th. And we're going to go, what do, they're going to go, what, what do we have to do? And we're going to, you know, we're going to be on another podcast talking about it. Well, uh, this podcast, I think we've uh, we've hit our, our limit there, Dennis. I appreciate you taking a little time with me today to, to sort of explore what's going on, the, the, the Monday through Friday realities of this grim season and the Saturday joy of watching games be played and, and talking about playoff races. Dennis Dodd is uh, from CBS Sports. He is my friend and he is terrific. Thanks so much, Dennis, for uh, joining me today. Ralph, it was enlightening and educational as always. Thanks for having me on. And now, three and out. First down. Florida quarterback Kyle Trask is rocketing up Heisman watch lists with a season that so far stacks up comparably to Joe Burrow's historic run last year with LSU. Trask Heisman campaign, I think, faces a couple of obstacles. Let's go over them. I say this a lot, but Heisman contenders need to have a combination of numbers and narrative. What's your story and what is the story of your stats? Both of those things need to be digestible, easily digestible to voters. Trask's story is sort of Burrow's story, a good player who develops into a great player and has a historic season statistically for an SEC contender. I know that's an oversimplification of the trajectories of the two players. But the easily digestible narrative is basically the same, and voters just saw it last season. 
Plus, because Trask is matching Burrow's numbers, it takes away from some of the wow factor of Trask's gaudy stats. One other problem for Trask, he is competing against two players, Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields in particular, who are considered franchise quarterback prospects and the likely two first picks in the NFL draft. Trask doesn't have that kind of prospect shine. Heck, he might not even be as good a pro prospect as BYU's Zach Wilson. At this rate, Trask is probably going to play himself into the first round of the draft, but he's not Lawrence nor Fields. Now, should that matter? Probably not. The Heisman is an award for college performance, but think about it. If everybody is putting up gaudy stats, but in varying number of games and under different circumstances, at some point you'd think voters would ask a simple question. Which of these players is best? I don't think Trask is going to win a lot of voters who make that assessment, and I think it's a fair assessment to make, especially in this weird season. Second down. It's only two games, but Oregon is averaging over eight yards per play under offensive coordinator Joe Moorhead. The Ducks need to clean up their turnovers. They are sitting at minus five. But if they do, they could be on the way to running the table in the Pac-12 and maybe giving the conference a team the playoff selection committee has to give serious consideration to. Third down, no conference has had a tougher time with COVID-19 than CUSA. By my count, it has had 13 games postponed or canceled. I bring this up because Marshall, which is having a really good year, has two games left on its schedule and at least one more that could get made up. All of them are against teams that have had a difficult time just getting on the field this season, Charlotte, Rice, and FIU. I realize Marshall can't just blow off its conference two-thirds of the way into the season, but it would be far more interesting for the Thundering Herd to try to get a game scheduled with BYU or maybe even Liberty than to play three CUSA teams that don't have much chance to be competitive. That's the show for today. I'd like to thank my producer, Sarah McCrory, for making me sound good. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts and Westwood One Podcast. Please subscribe so you do not miss an episode. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. Thanks for listening and come back for more next week of the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast.